Mr. Wolf, and it's certainly great to be back here in Berkeley with all of you, and thank you for coming out. Uh, here are little cards about uh, my book, just in case you are interested in learning a little bit more about it. Thank you. And uh, the subtitle of my talk really should be uh, From Disaster to Disaster. <laughs> my entire life has been an unmitigated disaster. <laughs> but in every disaster there's great opportunity, because unless you, you, you just listen to what happens in the Silicon Valley right now, disruptive technology. That's what everybody wants to talk about, you know, that's what's driving the whole American economy forward. Uh, but what's a disruptive, uh, a disruptive company? It's obviously something that will really hurt, take out of business some other company. So I was born on January 8, 1940, right at the beginning of World War II, and uh, I was born in Cologne, Germany. Uh, the westernmost big industrialized city, and as you can see on this picture, I was uh, pretty. Uh, well, I didn't know what the hell was going on there in this world. <laughs> <laughs> pretty confused little kid. Uh, Cologne, let me just say one brief word about it, was uh, the subject of so many uh, raids 262 air raids, if you think the war lasted only four and a half years. Uh, why Cologne? First of all, Cologne was the westernmost industrial city in all of Germany. It's about 50 miles away from Belgium, and so from England it was easy to reach, to get to Frankfurt, to get to Stuttgart, to get to Dresden or Berlin was very difficult to do, a long, much, much uh, tougher uh, road to home. Second, Cologne was an industrial city. Uh, we had factories there that built uh, the big engines, diesel engines that uh, Klockner Humboldt Deutz, that were in submarines, that were in tanks, and in other uh, things that the German army badly needed. So that was a main target. There was also a lot of chemical uh, industry there. And uh, Cologne also was a target because later on in the war, when the Allies tried to reach targets, let's say, in Frankfurt or Stuttgart, and if there was a cloud cover and they couldn't really find that target, they turned around. Now they had a problem. The planes were flying back, but they couldn't land with their bomb load. Uh, it was just impossible to do. So they had to drop the bombs before they would land back at their bases in England. And, uh, well, Cologne, there was a big cathedral sitting there that everybody could see. It was right on the Rhine River, which you could easily detect. The last big German cities, and they said, okay, let them go. And so Cologne was bombed over and over uh, again. You know, just to put a little bit in perspective, a thousand bombers overhead. Anybody has an idea how many bombers the U.S. Air Force has right now? Less than a thousand. Less than a thousand. 164 bombers. It's the entire U.S. bomber fleet. Now we have other ways to deliver uh, bombs, you know, uh, rockets and what Drones. have you. Uh, but you know, it's it, it's a lot of a lot of airplanes. That's all I want to say. So the war is over, May 45, and what we go back to Cologne. Why my mother went back to Cologne, I still can't fathom. Here's the official passport that the American government gave us. Paul Jenkins signed it. And uh, it was issued on uh, the 10th of June, one month after the war ends. And my mother's name, Hella Caroline, and two persons, one of them is me, and to go back to Germany. And then it, it is typed in to uh, report to local Bürgermeister uh, and uh, travel on routes, you can see the next word, then it says persons have been examined and dusted, dusted. going home. Dusted meant that we were all sprayed with DDT, uh, get rid of the lice that we had gotten in our little cave. So we went back to Cologne and here's basically what we found. Uh, our house had finally been hit and uh, that's our kitchen there where the, where the, on the second floor where the bomb hit. And one of our uh, workers from the distillery was killed in, in that thing. And here's another view from the other direction. You can see all the rubble uh, in front of it. And uh, so 
we moved into uh, an apartment not too far away from there. About 95% of, of the houses in Cologne were destroyed or damaged. Here you see an aerial picture of Cologne. Mm -hmm. And that picture was taken by an American plane exactly above our house, looking towards the center of the city, coming to America. Here I am with my girlfriend, the one in the middle, and her parents, and uh, she's on the ship coming over to uh, the U.S., and obviously I'm flying on Lufthansa, but I'm flying on a freighter uh, to the United States, so uh, well, I won't waste time now with, uh, I can tell you more stories about the freighter. <laughs> and. Uh, my girlfriend had gotten a, a, a scholarship to go to College of St. Teresa in Winona, Minnesota. So we'd run a circle of 200 miles around Winona, Minnesota, and I applied at 84 colleges within that circle. I got admitted maybe at a dozen. Parsons College, Fairfield, Iowa, gave me. You know it? You heard of it? Right. Fabulous. Very few people have heard of it. You know what it is today? No. Parsons College, Fairfield, Iowa, was known as America's worst college. <laughs> the uh, week that I arrived in the country, uh, Life magazine had an article with a headline that said, Welcome to Flunk Out You. It was basically a little college where rich kids that had flunked out of one or two different colleges found finally a place where they could uh, have as many parties as they wanted to have. <laughs> so here's the academic procession of Parsons College entering Barhyth uh, Chapel. <coughs> I had a good time at Parsons, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> I was able to get out of Parsons in one single year. And Berkeley offered me a teaching assistantship, miracles do happen, and here I am sitting with, I'm the one in the background, sitting with my friend in the new student union, which had just been uh, uh, built in those days. You recognize it. Those were also, as soon as I arrived in Berkeley, uh, I called, the, I said the student riots broke out, uh, broke out, and most of the people around it, they said the free speech movement started. So here's the free speech movement. Uh, Mario Savio is the second one from the right, what is unusual about this picture? They're all wearing ties. Mm -hmm. They're all wearing ties. Those were the wild and woolly rebels of the wild and woolly 60s. <laughs> they're all wearing coats, they're all wearing ties, and the ladies in their finest Sunday costume, like if they're ready to go to school. And that's the way they were demonstrating in those days. So uh, again, I saw a lot of bedlam around me, you know, everybody was going to meetings and uh, joining labor unions, forming new labor unions and what have you, burning down the Bank of America building on Telegraph. They were all very busy. I said, Jesus, that's what I came here for. I studied like hell. I got my PhD in three years and I was out of here. I come to Bank of America. It's the biggest bank in the world. And the stock is high and, you know, we're all proud. And, uh, Three years later, uh, the uh, the mid 1980s, uh, the uh, you know the big uh, the first uh, huge inflation strikes in 1980. Uh, the bank loses money all over the place. The loans in the agricultural area, in the industrial area, a lot of energy loans and so on. Anyhow, the bank is on the verge of bankruptcy, and I get a phone call. Uh, from the White House one day and say, hey, you want to join the Federal Reserve Board? I say, wow, we, thank you for this rescue operation, you know. Uh, I thought I'd gone to heaven. 